From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Ann Ward. Mrs. Valentine. Have you heard anything about Dan? Nothing, Mrs. Valentine. The police are looking everywhere for him. I went to the hospital tonight and they told me he walked out. He might die, Mr. Dollar. I know, Mrs. Valentine. Did you tell anyone I was here in New Orleans? If you mean, did I mention it to the police? No. Thank you, Mr. Dollar. That was very kind of you. But it makes me mad that I didn't, Mrs. Valentine. I know you don't want anybody to find you're related to him because of your daughter. But I also think you could help the police in this situation. You could help them find Dan and put him back in a hospital. Mr. Dollar, would you come over and talk to me, please? Please. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the New Britain Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut... The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Valentine matter. Some more expense. I believe this is item five. Yeah, four bucks. Four drinks for myself. When a next big shot of the Roaring Twenties like Dan Valentine carries a $50,000 life insurance policy and walks down the street one day and gets himself shot and refuses to disclose who fired the bullets, I have to do the worrying for the insurance company. When he decides to leave a hospital bed minus a pint or two of blood, I have to worry some more. I needed those drinks. You can just say I liked what I'd seen of the guy, and I didn't want him to walk around New Orleans bleeding to death. In here, please, Mr. Dollar. The wife, who hadn't seen or heard from him for 13 years, looked pale and wan. It was obvious that the strain was beginning to tell on her, although she tried hard not to show it. Doesn't it ever cool off in New Orleans? Sometimes. But I'm not here to talk about the weather, Mrs. Valentine. You know that. Yes, I know. Well, don't just stand there and give me the tears, then. If you've got anything to say, say it. If you know anything that'll help, let me know about it. You're perfectly right in being angry with me. Mr. Dollar, I honestly don't know where Dan is. Well, do you know why he'd get up out of a hospital bed and endanger his life? I have an idea he might have wanted to see somebody. Who? I don't know. The two men who shot at him? Perhaps I just don't know. We aren't getting anywhere, Mrs. Valentine. Look, I'm going to talk to you frankly. Why did he come here to live in New Orleans? Well, I... You live in New England with your daughter, Teresa. Obviously, Dan thinks a great deal of you and her. He's given you everything, provided for you with all of his troubles. Spent 13 years in prison. I can imagine his thoughts about you and her while he was in there. And yet he comes out and lives 2,000 miles away from you. He didn't want to interfere with Teresa in any way. Sure, but it seems to me he'd want to look at you, at her, certainly. Even if it was a matter of living in Boston and taking a bus to New Salem and standing on a street corner one day to watch the two of you cross the street. That sound reasonable to you? If you put it that way. Well, look, there's some reason he picked New Orleans, some reason he didn't give himself the little gratification of just looking at you and Teresa. Why? Why here? I'm sure I don't know. And why is he running around now? I can't answer that either. But it must have something to do with you and your daughter. Obviously, you're the only ones he ever cared about. Well? I honestly don't know. Well, and I I can't help you, and I can't help myself or him. You mentioned his having a reason to be in New Orleans. Maybe... What? There was a man named Webster... Conrad Webster. He was a member of the Illinois Bar once in those days. Did a great deal of work for Dan and friends of Dan. I think he lived here. Wait a minute. I've seen that name. Yeah, on copies of the insurance policy. A man named Webster had the power of attorney. He bought the insurance. There's a trust in there for your daughter. Yes, Conrad Webster was an old friend of Dan's. I don't even know whether he's alive now or not. He drank a great deal later on, I think he lived here. Was he the kind of friend Dan would go to if he needed help? Yes, I think so. All right. What are you going to do? It's just something to look into. I'll try and find Webster, and maybe I can find your husband. Thank you for coming by. I needed somebody to talk to. (laughs) What? I hope he stays alive, Mrs. Valentine. (laughs) 
Item seven, sixteen dollars. The money it cost me to find out the location of Conrad Webster. I started at his last known address, followed a series of bars, and finally got information from a bartender that led me to the crummier half of a decaying duplex on Gentilly Street. Everything was quiet for Gentilly Street. Huh. Young man, the drugstore delivers what I need most. The telegraph office what I dread most. Obviously, you represent neither, and therefore you are no concern of mine. Wait a minute. Are you Mr. Webster? Conrad Webster? I am he, and I am drunk and disheveled, and it is three o'clock in the morning. I'd like to talk with you. May I come in? You may not. This isn't exactly the hour for making calls, but I did stop by and pick up something to take the edge off. Ted? Huh? It's bonded. Oh, wait, inside, inside. Now then, you uh, were going to apologize. Here you are, Mr. Webster. Uh, uh, oh, well... Now then, as long as this lasts, you will last. All right. I'm looking for a man. (laughs) The entire world is looking for a man. Just one man. A man they blindly presume will break off these shackles that bind us and lead us forth into eternal justice. Yeah, yeah, sure, but that's not... An ironic anticipation. I'm talking about Dan Valentine. You are? Yes, I'm a friend of his. No. No, you don't come from that place. The pallet is not with you. You lie. I didn't say I was in jail with him. And where else would he have made friends these long years? He's out of prison now. He's been out for three months. And I'm aware of that. Did you know he was shot at yesterday? Three hours ago, he left his hospital bed? I thought he might have come to you. Is he here? He is not. Do you know where he is? I do not. Mr. Webster, if Valentine isn't back in the hospital pretty soon, he'll die. (laughs) Why is the phenomenon of death so persistently alarming? So he will die. They all die. Usually from a bullet. And that's what's going to happen to him. Two bullets he stopped yesterday. Do you understand me? Acutely, acutely. You've impressed me with the urgency of his situation. But Dan Valentine is not here, nor has he been here, nor has he contacted me, nor do I know where to contact him. All right, Mr. Webster, all right. I guess I believe you. Your your concern for him is a distressing irritation. Well, Well, what is the reason for it? I'm an insurance investigator, and it's my job to keep him alive. More than that, I like him. I told you I was his friend. I think he deserves to live. You, his friend? No. You are too young to be his friend. His friends, for the most part, are gone. Like the long years. Like Hamburg hats and the Charleston and Lime Ricky. The ones who are left are broken and tired and faded. With old faces. Faces like mine. Like his. And we should be gone, too. Another age is here. (laughs) This is my sadness. As for yours, Dan Valentine should never have lived in that age or this age. He was meant to be an explorer, a pioneer who conquered a wilderness, not a racketeer who conquered a west side. Are you sure you're his friend, Mr. Webster? I once thought so. (laughs) He once thought so. Now, I haven't strength enough to be anyone's friend. What's your name? Johnny Dollar. Good night, Mr. Dollar. The look in Conrad Webster's eyes held the same sort of sadness I had seen in Valentine's eyes. But they were different, too. They held a weakness. The strong, sad eyes were somewhere else in the city, walking alone, probably looking for two gunmen, and the lifeblood was slowly draining from the body that sparked them. I went back to my hotel and tried to sleep, but sleep wouldn't come. I was still rolling and tossing at 7.30 the next morning when orange juice, coffee, and the morning paper came up. A nationwide syndicate had picked up the new development in the Valentine shooting and gone to work on it. 
Among other names they mentioned in giving a resume of Valentine's career were his wife and daughter, living in New Salem under the name of Ward. Hello? This is Johnny Dollar. I just read the morning paper, Mrs. Valentine. Oh, yes. I'm sorry it broke for you this way. That's very kind of you to say so. Maybe it's for the better, anyhow. For years I've been wanting to tell Teresa who her father is, what he's like. I'm going to call her later today. Tell her where I am and explain why I'm here. I think she can take it. You're doing pretty well yourself. <laughs> Thanks again. Any word yet? No. No, we still can't find him. Mr. Webster, did you find him? Yes, he wasn't much help. The New England paper said that Mrs. Ward was out of town. Sooner or later they'll find out what town Mrs. Ward is in, I'm afraid. Well, maybe you'd better get another hotel, use another name. Yes. All right, I'll wait to hear from you. Mr. Dollar. Yes? Thank you. I put in another call to Inspector DeBaca and asked him about developments. Valentine was still unlocated. They were covering drugstores and doctor's offices where he might seek assistance. The two unidentified men who had shot him were still unidentified. The police weren't able to dig up any more witnesses or get any line on the car. By four in the afternoon, Mrs. Valentine had still not called me to report a new address. I got worried and went over to the Roosevelt to see what was what. I was surprised to see Inspector DeBaca in the lobby talking to the bell captain. All right, son. If you remember anything else, call me here. Yes, sir. I sure will. Hi. Hi, Dollar. Well, you want to talk first or you want me to? All right, I'll talk first. Mrs. Valentine's been staying here under the name of Ann Ward. You knew that. Yeah. Why didn't you say anything to me? She asked me not to. Doesn't make any difference now, anyhow. That boy over there called us a little while ago. He said that Dan Valentine came in here this afternoon, went upstairs, came back down 15 minutes later with Mrs. Valentine. They both left together. Yeah, he must have seen the story in this morning's paper and guessed she was in town. That's the way I see it. Well, we're right back where we started from, and I'm about sick of it. We're a little better off. Two people are easier to find than one. We found them all right at 7 o'clock that night, and it was easy. Three squad cars were already drawn up in front of the little hotel, and I noticed with a sinking heart that a hearse was there also. Dan Valentine and his wife were dead. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Valentine matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, proof that the murder of Dan Valentine and his wife aren't the only murders to be solved. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for another exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.